War and Peace, Book Six, Chapter Three, read for LibriVox.org by Roger Moline. Next morning, having taken leave of no one but the count and not waiting for the ladies to appear, Prince Andrew set off for home. It was already the beginning of June when, on his return journey, he drove into the birch forest where the gnarled old oak had made so strange and memorable an impression on him. In the forest, the harness bells sounded yet more muffled than they had done six weeks before, for now all was thick, shady, and dense, and the young firs dotted about in the forest did not jar on the general beauty, but, lending themselves to the mood around, were delicately green with fluffy young shoots. The whole day had been hot. Somewhere a storm was gathering but only a small cloud had scattered some raindrops lightly, sprinkling the road and the sappy leaves. The left side of the forest was dark in the shade, the right side glittered in the sunlight, wet and shiny, and scarcely swayed by the breeze. Everything was in blossom. The nightingales trilled, and their voices reverberated, now near, now far away. Yes, here in this forest was the oak with which I agreed, thought Prince Andrew. But where is it? he again wondered, gazing at the left side of the road, and without recognizing it he looked with admiration at the very oak he sought. The old oak, quite transfigured, spreading out a canopy of sappy, dark green foliage, stood wrapped and slightly trembling in the rays of the evening sun. Neither gnarled fingers, nor old scars, nor old doubts and sorrows were any of them in evidence now. Through the hard, century-old bark, even where there were no twigs, leaves had sprouted such as one could hardly believe the old veteran could have produced. Yes, it is the same oak, thought Prince Andrew, and all at once he was seized by an unreasoning springtime feeling of joy and renewal. All the best moments of his life suddenly rose to his memory. Austerlitz with the lofty heavens, his wife's dead reproachful face, Pierre at the ferry, that girl thrilled by the beauty of the night, and that night itself, and the moon, and... All this rushed suddenly to his mind. No, life is not over at thirty-one. Prince Andrew suddenly decided finally and decisively. It is not enough for me to know what I have in me. Everyone must know it. Pierre and that young girl who wanted to fly away into the sky. Everyone must know me, so that my life may not be lived for myself alone while others live so apart from it, but so that it may be reflected in them all, and they and I may live in harmony. On reaching home, Prince Andrew decided to go to Petersburg that autumn and found all sorts of reasons for this decision. A whole series of sensible and logical considerations showing it to be essential for him to go to Petersburg, and even to re-enter the service, kept springing up in his mind. He could not now understand how he could ever even have doubted the necessity of taking an active share in life, just as a month before he had not understood how the idea of leaving the quiet country could ever enter his head. It now seemed clear to him that all his experience of life must be senselessly wasted unless he applied it to some kind of work and again played an active part in life. He did not even remember how, formally, on the strength of similar wretched logical arguments, it had seemed obvious that he would be degrading himself if he now after the lessons he had had in life, allowed himself to believe in the possibility of being useful and in the possibility of happiness or love. Now reason suggested quite the opposite. After that journey to Ryazan, he found the country dull. His former pursuits no longer interested him, and often, when sitting alone in his study, he got up, went to the mirror, and gazed a long time at his own face. Then he would turn away to the portrait of his dead Lise, who, with hair curled a la grecque, 
looked tenderly and gaily at him out of the gilt frame. She did not now say those former terrible words to him, but looked simply, merrily, and inquisitively at him. And Prince Andrew, crossing his arms behind him, long paced the room, now frowning, now smiling, as he reflected on those irrational, inexpressible thoughts, secret as a crime, which altered his whole life and were connected with Pierre, with fame, with the girl at the window, the oak, and woman's beauty and love. And if anyone came into his room at such moments, he was particularly cold, stern, and above all, unpleasantly logical. My dear, Princess Mary entering at such a moment would say, little Nicholas can't go out today, it's very cold. If it were hot, Prince Andrew would reply at such times very dryly to his sister, he could go out in his smock, but as it is cold he must wear warm clothes which were designed for that purpose. That is what follows from the fact that it is cold, and not that a child who needs fresh air should remain at home, he would add with extreme logic, as if punishing someone for those secret illogical emotions that stirred within him. At such moments, Princess Mary would think how intellectual work dries men up. End of chapter 3 Recording by Roger Moline